Greetings, and welcome to ROI Clear. My name is Ray Hightower, and today we are fortunate to have as our guest, Mr. Justin Jensen. Justin is a certified public accountant. He's with the firm Morrison Clark and Company based here in Arizona. Their mm -hmm. tagline is a construction and real estate accounting firm that can help you build a business life and legacy. So uh, please join me in welcoming our guest, Justin Jensen. Welcome, Justin. Oh, thank you, Ray. That was beautiful. That was a wonderful introduction. Thank you. Well, let's let's uh, let's uh, go and dig deeper in because people are certainly anxious to know more about you. Why don't we start off with an elevator pitch? You're on an elevator with someone you want to influence, and in a in the course of an elevator ride, what would you tell them about you uh, and your firm and what you do? Oh, that's a great, great question. Uh, great place to start. Elevator pitch. You know, like you say, we do construction and real estate. We like to make sure that with, on the construction side that our clients are, are reporting their accounting the right way so that they can be qualified for more and more um, a, a bonding and, and get those larger, larger projects. When it comes to real estate, we like to make sure that we have the right entities in the right places to provide for the asset protection, but to allow for the tax benefits to flow through unobstructed. And then we like to make sure that we are, are making the most of the tax benefits. You know, it came out in the, in the news a year and a half ago that Donald Trump had only paid $750 in taxes. I got approached a lot. Justin, you're a CPA. Is that fair? And I say, no, that's terrible. I think it's awful. He, he paid too much. He should have come to me. He would have paid zero. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, so I, I, we like to be involved proactive. Yes. That's yes. more than 30 seconds. I apologize. Please. No, no, that's fine. It's more than an elevator ride, but let's say that was an elevator ride on a really tall building. So we're yeah, well, good. It's a tall building. I, I talk too much. I <laughs> no, no, that is perfect <laughs> because you, you touched on many things that certainly we want to explore. We touched on the fact that you're a CPA. And also, you know what? We need to make sure that our guests know that you're not just a CPA, but you're also an investor in deals. You're an investor in multifamily deals, an that's investor correct. in these things. So tell us about your journey. Can you tell us about your journey to becoming a CPA? And you talked about how you're helping people on reducing the taxes, but tell us about your journey to becoming a CPA and then becoming an investor in real estate. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for asking. I, it's, it's kind of an interesting story. I, when I was in graduate school, <clears throat> I just wanted to get some real life experience, right? I ended up getting an internship with a real estate investment company. Mm -hmm. And for that first year, this was in 2000, all I did was prepare tax returns. But I thought, I have arrived. This is as good as it gets. Um, after graduating- You loved tax returns. I, well, I did. I thought so. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> and I did. Well, I thought, you know, I thought, hey, this is cool. It's professional. It's, in, um, it's, it, it's with this big company. At the time, it, it was a, a real estate investment company with about $4 billion in asset or assets under management. And, uh, you know, I prepared tax returns. <clears throat> it got me on the real estate path because after I graduated, I, I moved to Seattle, Washington. I worked for PricewaterhouseCoopers for four years. Um, and, and essentially the short story is they said, oh, hey, you did real estate. Let's just have you keep doing real estate. So I got involved with very high level cost segregation, um, investment, I mean, uh, real estate investment companies, development companies, real estate investors, high net worth individuals. It, it was a great, um, training grounds at that high level. Four years after that, that company I did an internship with called and said, hey, we're starting a new tax internal tax department. Um, prior to that, they had farmed out all of their tax reporting. They wanted to do it in-house. So they yes. hired me as their tax director. And uh, I oversaw a team of about 10 preparers. We did, we did 350, 450 very complex tax returns. It was, it was another good, good training ground. But what got me into real estate is... <clears throat> When I moved to, from Seattle to Utah, I turned my home into my first rental property. It was, it was a single family home. Mm -hmm. That was my, my hands-on introduction. Yes. But then all, also as the tax director of that company, I was involved with acquisitions of assets. And as part of the acquisition team, I was entitled to my share of the commissions and the fees, the acquisition fees. But in lieu of taking the cash, I, I plowed it back into the property and said, you know, I'll take the equity. Um, 15 years later, I'm still investing with that company. And I still, uh, like you say, involved in real estate. And, you know, after, after four years with that company, I'm sorry, three years with that company, I, I thought, well, I miss public accounting. I went out on my own. 
a lot of the investors in that company followed me. And so then when I was on my own as a, as a practitioner, I had a real estate base. Um, I wasn't gaining enough traction. I, I needed more. I was, I, was, I was doing networking on LinkedIn one day. This was in 2010. Yes. Late in 2010. Uh, I found a, a job being uh, advertised for a CPA with big four experience, which I'd had with PricewaterhouseCoopers, a real estate background and an entrepreneurial mindset. And I thought, oh, this sounds really interesting. So I applied for the job. Um, they, they flew me from Utah to Phoenix, Arizona. It's a company based in Tempe, Arizona. And uh, they interviewed me, hired me on the spot. That was Tom Wheelwright's firm, ProVision. Yes. And that was in 2011. And I was with that firm for five years. And, and let me tell you, that was wonderful yeah. training and experience. And, and for the last year I was there, I had the opportunity to travel with Tom Wheelwright, also with Garrett Sutton, to, to help them as they taught a tax and asset protection class. Oh my yes. goodness, talk about just in the trenches, good, good training. Um, stuff that I still draw from now, I still consider Tom a, a mentor. Um, you know, I, I, I contact him as often as I can and uh, still, I, I'm grateful for the training I got from him. Um, but it just snowballed into this. Now I do real estate as an investor. I've done real estate professionally for 20 years and it's just, it's just what I do. When I found Morrison Clark and company, they were looking for a real estate minded person um, to add to their portfolio. When I saw the mantra business life and legacy and how that was, they, they call it full circle. We call it full circle accounting where we don't want you to just bring us your files in March and then do your tax return. We'll see how it shakes out. See you next year. Yes. We want to meet with you during the year to be proactive so that then when you bring your materials, your documents in March, we file a tax return and we say, Hey, this is our report card. Look how well the strategy was. Look how, look how much tax we were able to save. And it's a more meaningful tax return. It's a more meaningful client and, and uh, CPA relationship. That is rich, Justin, just the, your background, everything you did from the internship from grad school and how you got involved with PwC and eventually Tom Wilwright and Garrett Sutton. And for those who don't know, Tom Wilwright and Garrett Sutton are connected to someone, an author that many people listening to this podcast know. And, and who is that author, would you like to say? Uh, that would be Mr. Robert Kiyosaki. Yes, the <laughs> author of Rich Dad, Dad Poor Dad. Dad. Yep, yep. Very, very important that you were you were mentored. And from what you said, you still consider Tom we're right to be a mentor. You were mentored and perhaps on some level are still being mentored by by uh, the, the man who handles uh, finances for Robert Kiyosaki, the rich dad, um, poor dad guy. Very much so. You know, I look back and I'm so glad that it turned out that way. It's just funny how things just happen sometimes. Uh, they're like meant to be. Um, Cause I went out on my own and my, my whole idea was that I was going to just undercut everybody on prices, get as many <laughs> clients as I could. Uh, that was the wrong way to do it. When I met Tom, he showed me a whole different way, a whole different approach. Yes. And a more proactive approach, which I bought just hook, line and sinker. I'm all in. And uh, so it's a philosophy I still follow now. So yeah, I, I, Tom Wheelwright is definitely a mentor for yeah. me. Now, you know what? Your, your answer to that question kind of takes us down a path, something I always like to ask about. When some of your clients come to you, what mistakes do they make? What are some of the common mistakes? You, you, uh, you shined the light on one mistake, that is just bringing you a shoebox full of receipts in March. <laughs> I'm kind of animating it a little bit or amplifying it a little bit, but essentially bringing, maybe it's an electronic shoebox full of receipts in March and expecting you to do the taxes. And, but you like to take more of a proactive approach. Tell us a little bit about some of the mistakes that entrepreneurs make when they engage you. And what are some things that we, and, and I count myself in that also as an entrepreneur, I, I wanna make sure I don't make that mistake either. What are some things that we as entrepreneurs should do to work with you more effectively? That's another great question. The, the thing I see the most is, and, and I understand why it happens, but what I see the most is someone will come to me and they're already sometimes three, four, five years into their investing, into their um, entrepreneurship, you know, starting a business. They're already neck deep into this and they, they, they just 
they went off in the wrong direction. You know, had they called somebody for help in the front and made sure that things were set up right from the very beginning, a lot of the headaches and the, the things that need to be corrected in the end could have been avoided. You know, and I say I understand because if you're just starting out, you know, you're cost conscious, you know, you, you're conscious, you want to be aware of where you're spending your money and, and preserve your resources. But I, I, I don't like to consider that as an expense. If you're, if you're paying a fee to me to, to consult with how to set up a business, how to set up your entity structures for tax purposes, for asset protection, that let's not look at that as an expense. Let's look at that as an investment. And, hmm. and the idea is that in that short period of time, since you've avoided the costly mistakes down the line, you're getting a return on that investment because that's money that you're going to save in the long run by, by not being afraid of those fees on the front end. And, and listen, and I don't mean to be a, like a salesy guy, but because of that, when it, when it comes to those new clients that are just getting started, I'm very cost conscious and mm -hmm. I don't want them to hesitate to call me, say, like, please call me. And then, you know, help them get off the ground. And then, yeah, I mean, we, we charge for our time. That's how we, that's our business. That's what we do. Um, but I want to get you off the ground. The, the, the saying goes that, uh, you know, CPAs have this black box of secrets. And if I tell you all my secrets, then you just don't need me anymore. And you won't come back. So I have to keep those close to, close to my chest. Um, <laughs> I don't buy into that at all. I really yeah. think that uh, I'm going to tell you everything I know you know, especially in real estate, and I am experienced in real estate, I'm going to share with you everything I know. I'm going to help you develop a, a, a criteria. I'm uh, going to help you analyze mm -hmm. the, the properties. I've done that for a very long time. Um, so that I'll, I'll share everything I know so that you become wildly successful. The more successful you are, the more complicated your taxes become, the more you need me. So I'll see you. <laughs> <laughs> The more successful you become, the more complicated your taxes become, the more you need. Yeah, that, that's interesting. And that's just uh, the reality. That's a fact of life. Yep. I, I would say that even if CPAs like you have a black box of secrets, as you describe it, you're very good at word pictures, too. You're very, very vivid word pictures you give. So even if CPAs have a black box of secrets, from what I've seen, you know, I, I, I ran another company for 21 years that I sold and I've been running my current company for uh, five years now. From what I've seen of that black, black box of secrets, the secrets inside the box ch tend to change and evolve over time. Yeah. Because, yeah, as I'm thinking about something like uh, bonus depreciation that uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, bonus depreciation came on board in 2017 and now it's getting phased out this year over the next several years. So is, is that a, a true or is that? Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. OK, it came back in 2017 and, and oh, um, you know, we're riding that wave to making the most of it. 2022 is the last year you'll get that 100%. It'll start to phase out 20% a year for the next few years. Yes. But, uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right. And you mentioned it's always changing. And honestly, that's what I loved about, uh, or that's what I love about being a CPA in public practice. Um, I mentioned I was three, four years with that property management company in real estate, but it was the same fires, the same things every day, day in and day out. I really yes. miss the freshness of meeting with clients, getting to know people, helping solve their problems. And it's a different set of problems all the time. But every time Congress comes out with a new, uh, you know, with a new tax act, I lovingly call that the accountants full employment act. <laughs> it, keeps me, it keeps me busy and it keeps me, you know, you, it's always changing. You've got to stay on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I like the idea. I think it was you who said this. You may have said this during a presentation to one of the meetups here in Arizona, how the tax code really, it's the government's way of providing incentives for certain behavior. To, 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 and could you elaborate on that? I think it was you who said that, or maybe, yeah. I'll give you credit for it. Well, I appreciate the credit for it, but I'll tell you, I learned it from Tom Wheelwright, obviously. Okay. And, it, it, and you know, grateful for the things I learned from him. Um, but you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I, I saw, I got involved in a conversation recently where um, someone had made the comment that they don't pay very much in taxes and, and it's their goal to not pay taxes. And there was some, it was on LinkedIn and there was some backlash where people were saying, oh, well, if you're not paying your fair share, then, you know, then you're not entitled to the benefits that come from paying taxes and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, oh, cry me a river. Give me a break because 
like I mentioned early on or earlier that Donald Trump had only paid 750 in taxes and people mm -hmm. thought, well, that's not fair. Cause all they see is that he didn't pay much more. You know, he paid $750 in taxes and they're paying thousands and thousands of dollars in taxes. Um, but what they don't see is that he took money and he parted with it. He invested in real estate. He mm. pumped, pumped money into the economy, he provided jobs, he provided housing. He did things that the government is not very good at doing. You know, mm -hmm. They're not in the business of real estate. They're not in the business of housing. They're not, they're not good at those things. They know that we as citizens are. So if they incentivize, if they incentivize us to do it through tax code, then, then when we do it, our reward is we have the opportunity to you know, shelter some income. But, the, but again, the, the, the idea that he just got to sit on cash and not, or, and not pay taxes is ridiculous. The, the, the complexity of the tax code is a series of incentives to incentivize you as a taxpayer to invest in the things that the government wants you to do because mm -hmm. they don't want to do it and they're not very good at it and they know that they're not good at it. So, you know, that they, that's why the tax code exists. The, uh, and I'm going on and on, I apologize, but the oh, complexity of the tax code, you think about it, the 5,000 pages of tax code. If you're a W-2 wage earner with 1099s, then maybe 50 or 60 pages apply to you. The rest of it don't even apply. Don't, don't stay up at night thinking about how complex taxes are. They don't, they don't apply to you. It's not hard. It's not, it, it's not difficult at all. But the more um, you move into, and you mentioned Robert Kiyosaki, he has a yes. cash flow quadrant. If you're in the E quadrant as an employee, your taxes are very simple. Yes. Um, and, and as far as tax planning goes, you'll be told, I oh, contribute to a 401k, do some you know, deferred tax planning. That's terrible tax advice, uh, especially because there's thousands and thousands of pages available to the SB and the I quadrant folks that can enable you to pay less tax. Pay yes. a lot less tax, in some cases, zero tax. Right, because those incentives are there. And we need to make a point to include a link to Robert Kiyosaki's book, Cashflow Quadrant. That was, I think that was his third book in the series, second or third book in the series. But yeah, we'll, we'll uh, include a link to that. Well, here, so that excellent. Yeah, because we want to make sure. And you know, the fact is many of our listeners will, will already be familiar with the, uh, the four quadrants, the ESBI that you mentioned, but that, that, that's a fantastic way to look at how to manage taxes across the board. Mm -hmm. I like the point that you make that those of us who are in real estate and those of us who are in business, I mean, we are BizDay Global. We believe that business is very important to the planet, to our world, and that when we're doing business with each other, one, we're not dropping bombs on each other, but we're also providing services that all of us need. We're providing food, clothing, and shelter, the basic services, but a lot of things that we need just to make life um, fun and fulfilling and, and just to, to help each other out. So I love that about your group. The whole, yeah. the business community is global. I mean, products in this country ship to that country. And yes. you know, we're all working together here. I love that. Yeah. You know what? You know what inspired that? I think it was Milton Friedman, uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner in economics and a professor at University of Chicago. One day in one of his lectures, and he's, he probably did this more than once, he held up a pencil. And he held up this pencil and, and he said, where is this pencil made? And he went through how each element of the pencil, a simple item like a pencil, was made by companies all over the planet. The graphic, graphite came from one nation. The wood came from another nation. The right. pigment in the paint came from another nation. The solvent in the paint came from somewhere else. There's the metal for the eraser that holds the, the eraser in place, and the rubber for the eraser came from somewhere else. And that's just a pencil. A pencil. Yeah. Yeah. Not a car, not a computer. I mean, it's a pencil. <laughs> yes, yes. And there is, no, there is no one nation that builds all of that. We have to all come together across the planet to do that. And I, I just believe that if we promote that idea and if, if we recognize it and execute on that, that we're more likely to get along with each other. But you know what? I just went on a rant, and this is your interview, not mine. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> 
I, I just work here. I do what I'm told. <laughs> no, you're, uh, you're great. You're doing wonderful, wonderful stuff here. So you know what? Let's dig down a little bit in a couple of terms that some of our real estate investors know. We have people listening to the podcast who are in a wide variety of businesses. Some people own tech companies. Some may own hotels. Others own multifamily real estate. Yeah. Uh, talk to us a little bit about, we alluded to bonus depreciation earlier. Is there a simple definition you can give us for bonus depreciation? And I'm going to ask you about 1031 exchanges too. So just we'll to... talk about that for sure. Okay. Um, you know, that's a really good question. I, the best thing I could think of would be, say for example, and I'll, I'll use like a million dollars uh, property acquisition because that's, that's a nice round number. It, yes. and, and maybe that's you by yourself. Um, um, but if it's a syndication, you could add one or two zeros and it would be the exact same scenario. Million dollars, you're getting a 80% loan to value to acquire the property. So you got to come up with $200,000 down yes. and you, you acquire this million dollar property. Next step, we have to take, we have to take the, the property and allocate it between the land and the building. We are not able to depreciate the land. You're not making any more of it. We can't depreciate it. It's, it is what it is, but the building now, if, if we allocate 80% towards the building and 20% to the land, we have an $800,000 building and a $200,000 piece of land. Um, so that means our $200,000 down payment bought us an $800,000 depreciable asset. If we're talking about uh, uh, multifamily housing, residential real estate, then if we do nothing, we're going to depreciate that structure over 27 and a half years. It's just under 30000 a year. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's and, and 27 and a half years is a long time. But in that 27 and a half years, we've got flooring, we've got other elements and aspects of the building that are not going to last 27 and a half years. They're going to need to be replaced. So if we'll do a cost segregation study, I mentioned I started to do this uh, when I worked at PricewaterhouseCoopers back in 2001. Um, if we'll do a cost segregation study, we can take part of that 800,000 and we can move it out of the 27 and a half year category, put it in a five year category, a 10 year category, a 15 year category. Those short lived assets are eligible for bonus depreciation. So now if I take 800,000 and I do a cost segregation study, anywhere from say 20%, 25% on the low end to 30, even a third, 33% on the higher end, um, gets reallocated away from 800,000 or away from the 27 and a half year class life to uh, five, 10, seven, or five, seven, 10 and 15 year class life. Um, it, so let's just say 30%, nice, easy math. Yes. That means my $800,000 depreciable asset becomes $240,000 in these other, these other um, classifications eligible for bonus depreciation in year one. So my $200,000 investment gives me a $240,000 deduction in year one. Boom. How does, how does Donald Trump pay 750? He should have paid zero. You know, because <laughs> if he follows, you know, I'm sure, and he's, he's got brilliant tax guys. Don't let me take away from that. But, but that's the concept that, uh, you know, now here's an opportunity to take this big deduction. We can shelter some income. Um, and, um, uh, you know, that's how bonus depreciation, bonus depreciation works. So um, in 2022, well, let's, let's do even easier math. Let's say it's 25%. So mm -hmm. uh, 800,000, 25% gets reclassed to five, seven, 10, and 15, gives me a $200,000 um, deduction, which is 100% of my, well, we'll take that 200,000 and we'll take 100% deduction on that. In 2023, we'll only get to take 80% of that. In 24, we'll only get to take 20% of that. So it'll come down a little bit. Now, I have been telling my clients, yes, let's take advantage of 100% while we can. But next year, I'll be saying, let's take advantage of 80% while we can. And then the year after, you know, let's take advantage of bonus depreciation. Um, and, and by then, I suspect that the law will change anyway. But even if it phases out to where all we get or we don't get bonus depreciation anymore. All we get to do is move some of those assets away from the 27 and a half year life to the five, seven, 10 and 15 year lives. Um, I would still do that. I would still accelerate the depreciation as much as I could because it gives us the opportunity to shelter the income. Because remember, I only paid $200,000 for this, for this property um, and the rest of it's being leveraged. That means the tenants are paying rent and they're, they're paying the mortgage. Right. 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 If I have a, a positive cash flow on that property, um, 
but I but I'm taking a deduction for depreciation. You don't have to pay for depreciation. It's a non-cash deduction. It's just something that the IRS allows you to write off over time. So I could, it's possible I could have positive cash flow in the property, but have enough depreciation to show a loss on my tax return, which means I've got this cash coming in that I'm pocketing that I'm not paying any taxes on. And that's not, that's not like a 401k contribution that's tax deferred. That's tax never. Yes. You know, yes. That's, that's real, real tax strategy right there. That's how it works. People need to be aware of the difference between tax deferred and tax never, as you said it. So, yeah. yeah. And I know you could go deeper, uh, longer than we have uh, time <laughs> for in this, in this interview. I love listening to you about this. You know, um, I'm not one who will read the entire tax code, as you said, you know, I'll leave Boy. that to you. <laughs> my, <laughs> you know, my wife calls different. that the, uh, the cure for insomnia. It really? Really? <laughs> yeah. When she can't sleep, she'll <laughs> ask you to talk to her about the tax code. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not joking. There was a, a few months ago, I was a guest lecturer for a tax school uh, in St. George, Utah, and I was reviewing the material and it was on the nightstand and she wanted to see what I was doing. I thought, oh, how nice. She's uh, <laughs> interested in what I do. No, she couldn't sleep. So, <laughs> that out. That's all right. That's wonderful. That, that's true. That's true love. That's true partnership right there. <laughs> Looking out for each other. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. We are coming to the end. This has gone so quickly. Uh, we're coming okay. to the end. Uh -huh. I can't end this without asking you about barbecue. You gave a description. There were a group of us together. You and a, and a group of us just a few nights ago, and you gave a captivating description of the perfect brisket. And we were just awed by the, <laughs> your word choice and your word pictures there. Talk to mm -hmm. us about barbecue for a few minutes, either brisket or what, talk to us about your passion for barbecue, if you will. Uh, I, I love barbecue. You know, I mentioned when I was introducing myself a little bit that I, I did, I started my own practice. Um, I was by myself and I ran it out of my house. Yes. Well, one of my first clients was actually my next door neighbor. This was in uh, Hyde Park, Utah, close to Logan, Utah. And uh, in Utah, in the summertime, you will open your windows to cool down the house. You know, yes. it, it'll get to be nice and cool at night. Um, well, when your next door neighbor is a competition barbecue pit master, and he's smoking <laughs> brisket all night long, you wake up at two in the morning and that, that aroma is wafting in your house. Oh, man, that, I, was, I was hooked. And yes. he'd come to our house occasionally and say, hey, I'm trying a new rib recipe. Do you guys mind eating these and tell me what you think? And, you know, we're like, again, okay. <laughs> um, he did become a client and I helped him with his taxes and his business strategy and what have you. But in asking him questions about um, barbecue, long story short, he said, well, why don't you just help me? So I competed on his team. Um, he asked me to, to join the Kansas City Barbecue Society. I held my certified barbecue judge designation for a short time. Um, and, and that was so that I could understand the barbecue. Um, so when we were having dinner the other night and we were having that brisket, I, every time I go to a new barbecue place, I had never been to that place. Every time I go to a new place, I like to uh, judge the barbecue. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, that was really good. So the, you know, the first thing you look at for, is the taste and tenderness uh, or the, t the appearance. And uh, it had a nice smoke ring. It, was, it looked very nice. Um, it wasn't gray. I picked it up and it was nice and tender. I could fold it over on each other and it didn't fall apart, but I could mm. pull it apart without any, without any, um, uh, it didn't have any tug to it at all. It just came right apart. It was, it was good. You know, I would have scored it nicely. Um, but it's just one of those things where, uh, you know, it's funny. I took, I took a few of my partners. Uh, we went to a barbecue lunch and it was in a new place. And I was teaching them how to judge the barbecue. And while we were there, the owner, the pit master, who I'd gone and talked to, he kept bringing us out sample after sample. And so I was like, okay, we were judging this. And, we were <laughs> and uh, we, re we really ate a lot. Um, that following weekend, I got a text message. It was on a Sunday. I was at church. I get a text yeah. message from my partner who says, I want to thank you for ruining barbecue for me for the rest of my life. <laughs> Because his friends all wanted to go to barbecue. And he said, okay, yeah. They all went out and they went to a restaurant, which I won't name by name. Everybody would know it. Yes. And, uh, 
he said that they brought out the barbecue. His friends were just going on and on about how good it was, but he looked at it and was like, this is terrible. <laughs> oh boy. And so it was ruined. But that, that place we went to the other night, that was really good. Yes. Yeah. They did well. They, they did well. Good. It was good. Yes. 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 Wow, we're, we're at the end of our interview. Uh, Justin Jensen, it's been wonderful. Justin Jensen, certified public accountant and certified barbecue judge. <laughs> Thank you for joining <laughs> us here at ROI Clear. Absolutely. That's what, my pleasure. Thank you, Ray. I really appreciate the opportunity.